in your face, all over the place. We're online 24-7, 24-7. You're listening to the hottest internet station. From beautiful Celine in southeastern Michigan. Around the world at sunskymysteries.com. This is the 2009 Top 10 Webcam in the World winner. This is S-E-P-B. Well, good evening, everybody. Bill Zam here. Welcome to our very first live show. First up tonight, we have the Internet Traffic Report from InternetTrafficReport.com. As you can see, North America is down to 72, and the average packet loss is 23%, with only 81% of the network functioning at this point. We also have a rather severe geo-electromagnetic storm, but we will soldier on, and we are recording the show in using four different methods, both mechanical and electronic, so the show will be available if we all happen to crash the website tonight. Our show is brought to you by the Small Company Moving Guide. We're seeing a lot more articles about people that are moving out of the cities and they are taking their families with them and they are just basically hightailing it because everybody's really starting to get nervous about what's going on and a lot of times there are small business owners and they have to pack up their business and move them too and you can't just throw all of your business materials into a tote box and throw it in your car that's why you need a publication like the Small Company Moving Guide. It's a workbook-style book that will help you move your small business. SmallCompanyMovingGuide.com And now I'd like to welcome our special guest, our very first guest here on Surrounded by um, People That Don't Participate, uh, Mr. Cliff High. Cliff, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, first up... We have some interesting weather information that uh, I believe Cliff wants to tell us about regarding uh, some of our friends up in Alaska. Cliff, take it away. Yeah, it was a uh, call from George Ure just before uh, connecting with you and reporting that the harp magnetometer has gone way off scale. Uh, we have to take these reports uh, with a grain of salt, but either way, it's not really good news. Uh, the magnetometer can broadcast energy, but it can also react to energy. So either way, uh, if it's reacting to the geomagnetic storm or if it's broadcasting, <coughs> we have the potential for an extremely large earthquake event in the next 72 hours, um, basically somewhere on the planet, but usually within the range of uh, 30 degrees north uh, latitude down to uh, 30 degrees south latitude or thereabouts. It can it can fluctuate to 6 to 8 degrees either way. Uh, so, but the 72 hours is usually fairly reliable. Then the order of magnitude here is about, by my calculations, about 35 percent larger than the magnetometer flux that was before the Fukushima uh, event, and that was on uh, March uh, 11th. So if you go, and it's also nearly the same pattern. The pattern is very uh, acutely um, pertinent as well. So just sort of a heads up. Uh, George calls me up in panic mode, <laughs> not really panic mode, but but get your attention mode, saying you know basically a 9-0 or a 10-0 in the next 72 hours. And it's like, well, okay, George, tell me the data. And his data would tend to support that based on what we saw with the uh, Fukushima event. Uh, so sort of a heads up there. Um, can you explain a little bit how the harp, and I'm sure a lot of people understand it, but maybe not completely like myself, how does the harp influence the um, tectonics of the, of the planet? Uh, you it's said above 30 degrees latitude, you said? Uh, between the band of the tropics, basically, is where it will have its most uh, impact. And it will shade north of the tropics either way. Uh, but the reason that is is because the angle of incidence from the HARP antenna array uh, angling through the sky. Basically, HARP is a giant uh, sky heater 
it uh, beams up energy in the form of what are close to microwaves that go on up and heat up the ionosphere, making it uh, change its shape and bulge out, making it reflect radio waves differently such that you can then propagate other energies and bounce radio waves around the planet, do interesting kind of things. Now, it is also true it's a basically an antenna array. Uh, acres and acres and acres of them up in Alaska, powered by the output of four giant turbines that suck on uh, the largest natural gas fine in Alaska, and it's been sitting there 24 hours a day being consumed by HARP and nothing else but HARP uh, since they hooked it all up and beaming up uh, heating the ionosphere. And here's our issue. We don't know whether HARP is simply reacting to the input from the sun or whether HARP is out there magnifying it, participating in this uh, geostorm uh, in an active sense or not, and it is sort of immaterial. Either way, whether they did the same in the Fukushima event or they were merely reacting, the HARP magnetometer prior to these large earthquakes such as Fukushima has a particular pattern. We've seen something that exceeds the Fukushima pattern without distorting it too much that tends to lend credence to the idea that there's going to be another very large earthquake, which we were waiting for anyway relative to the solar output. Right. Do you think possibly that... Um the solar output, right now we have a pretty strong geomagnetic storm. Do you think the solar output might actually be driving the thing out of control? It could, but even, even if that's the case, then the net result is probably going to be a very large earthquake because when you get that much energy flowing into the planet, the planet takes that energy, a lot of which goes all the way through the core of the planet in the form of high-energy particles such as neutrinos, goes in and it expands the plasma core, creates matter, and causes our planet to enlarge. And as we get earthquakes, as, it, as the, the crust cracks, because there's new matter being shoved up from below. So that's all, it all sounds, sounds to me like you're saying it's all interrelated. Correct. We can't, from our perspective, without going on up and seeing whether the switch is turned to active humming mode or simply turned off, we can't really tell whether HARP is merely participating or reporting. Because any antenna can work both ways, right. can broad, broadcast with it or receive. And it, it, it basically, in this case, it doesn't really matter much. A ton of energy is coming into the planet. Usually when those events occur, we have very large earthquakes within a short period, say from one day to five days out. Now, there's some people that think that the harp can also affect the weather. Oh, I'm certain of that. That's the accrued application of it. And it does so simply by, again, heating the atmosphere and distorting its shape such that uh, uh, imagine a heat beam from a hot air gun. It, it wouldn't be hot air, but a hot air gun aimed at a, a particular spot in, in a foggy area of your yard. You're going to clear out that area. Fog will not be there. So they can do that with harp just by aiming harp in a particular area. They can keep uh, moisture away from there, which I think was done over the summer, um, in order over the uh, mid middle part of the United States, I think the heat dome was a deliberate attempt on the part of the people that run HARP to try and keep the Fukushima radiation from the middle part of the country. Uh -huh. it, it was unsuccessful, but uh, it it basically caused a concentration in my area up here in the Pacific Northwest, and then also as far east as Boston along the coast. But then once the dome collapsed, the radiation was swept in pretty much instantly anyway. So it was, I don't know that it was worth the effort. Yeah. Now, obviously, everybody knows that we had the uh, big snowstorm in the Northeast all of this past week. We have uh, still have 2 million people without power up there. Um, it's October. The leaves are still on the trees and everything. Kids are still playing soccer and whatnot. Now, do you think that this is part of the... Um, ice age that we were talking about the last time that I interviewed you, because I remember yes, you were talking about an ice age coming. Yep. And in fact, <clears throat> I have somewhere on my server here an image of the coming um, winter United States map. While you're talking about that, I will bring that up so the viewers can uh, see what we're talking about here. Yeah, I believe that this uh, event uh, that occurred was part of a uh, changing weather uh, patterns on our Earth, and we've had a breakdown in a pattern that has um, held for perhaps uh, 120, 130 years. Uh, that breakdown may be 
uh, partially related to harp and the Russian version of it, the Chinese version of it, etc., going out and blasting all around and, and causing problems. But nonetheless, the issue is going to be that as the um, winter progresses, because basically fall is gone now. We've lost fall and we've lost spring, and we're going to have a very long winter that will start in, in October and go all the way through to about probably April or May, uh, maybe June or July where I'm at, because the storms will come across the Pacific, and they're going to be of such strength that they will continue to sweep from uh, the northwest here all across the country repeatedly as they did last year, only at a level of severity that we had not seen last year. So if you had a really rough time, with uh, your local winter last year, excessive snow, huge amounts of ice, and so on, prepare for the same again, but maybe as much as 40 or 60 percent larger amounts. That's a lot. Extremely so, yeah. And it may be that this year, it may be that we'll shade in this winter, and there will be spots on this planet that uh, in the winter of 2011-12 will continue all the way through their summer such that it snows again before it ever gets to be summer and we end up with many ice age or many glaciation events uh, starting all around the planet. Now, where, where is the moisture going to come from to support all of this, do you think? Well, the, uh, the part of the issue is that the, uh, what the, well, there, it's really complex. Uh, there's three or four major sources. One of the sources is the heating of the ocean. Uh, we know the ocean is being heated excessively because of the coral die-off, the gas changes, all the subsea volcanoes, all of this kind of stuff. Plus, all of these, uh, what they're called deep smokers, these giant uh, hot vents that are at the bottom of all of the trenches of the planet, mm -hmm. are also putting up water. Part of their constituent mass that they put out is not merely uh, sulfur dioxide gas and, and uh, near magma rock and so on, but many of them are venting extremely hot steam. This steam is not, as a lot of people would suppose, recycled ocean water that fell into the trench and is coming back out. It is wholly new water. It is original water that was created deep in the planet, has been heated up, and is pouring out in all of these fissures around there. That's why the oceans are rising. That's why we're having these exceptionally, exceptionally high tide conditions in Bangkok and all throughout Thailand that will also soon be reaching areas of the uh, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, even um, parts of uh, Australia. Um, and those kind of conditions are relating to the disproportionate movement of water on the planet. You have to understand that if we had a giant, if all of the uh, ice in Antarctica melted today and came off on a particular side of Antarctica, it would maybe take 50 to 80 years before the water was evenly spread around the planet. And it's because the oceans absorb it, but they don't do so um, evenly or quickly. And so we're having bulges appear uh, in parts of the planet in the oceanic surface that will cause local area distortions. But those bulges are also putting more heat and more uh, evaporation into the oceans, which causes the more atmosphere and more moisture. And that's getting us with the storms that are going to head right into the East Coast and dump snow on, you, on everybody uh, pretty much to the east of, oh, say, Spokane. I see. Now, <laughs> staying on this subject, because it's... For me, it's quite fascinating, and I think probably for the audience, too. What uh, the expanding Earth theory, if mm -hmm. the Earth is going through its expansion cycle, won't that mitigate the rise in the oceans, or are we getting uh, more water creation or more water coming up from the uh, really deep aquifers on the planet to offset that? Uh, the latter is true, but I don't think of it as an offset because as the planet expands, it is not true <coughs> that um, the oceans would withdraw as you might think because what's actually happening is very much like a balloon being inflated, not like a uh, rough hard surface being flattened out. Mm -hmm. So as a balloon is inflated, the water wants to spread out more evenly all around the planet. If this uh, expansion of the planet were taken to its logical conclusion, we would ultimately expand to the point where all the mountains were relatively flat and the, there was an evenly spaced ocean all around the planet because the, the ocean would be raised up by the expansion that's occurring in the bottom of the ocean as well as the uh, flattening of the taller parts of the planet 
because they're not growing. They're not being pushed out further away from the center of the planet. The arc that they are resting on. So let me let me see if I can explain this easily. The arc that is the Rocky Mountain chain that runs at an approximate um, uh, six, uh, 120 degree uh, tangential arc uh, off of a meridian. Is, is an arc that spreads basically from the far north all the way down through to the bulge of the equatorial, the part of the equatorial bulge that, that impacts the continental United States. That arc itself will flatten out. So relative to the rest of the planet, the Rockies are not getting smaller or shorter uh, in terms of altitude, but the arc that they're resting on is flattening out. So true, they are indeed flattening or becoming less tall. Does it make sense? Um. Yes, if you are, if you are, yeah, it like, does. If you arc your fingers together from both hands and touch the tips of your fingers together, what is that? And and put a little bit of tension in them. What is actually happening is that we're we're expanding the planet all over, and so we'll see that our our thumb and our little finger have to separate in order for the arc that is the middle fingers to flatten out some. And it is on that arc of our middle fingers that the big mountain chains rest on, and they're sort of getting flatter. And this is what's happened in, to Bangkok, and that's why they keep saying. I mean, it, I hate to laugh because it's it's actually quite horrific, but these poor people. People just do not understand, and so the government keeps making prognostications. Oh, oh, it'll go away next week, and they just don't understand that. No, I'm sorry, it's not going to go away. It, uh, we may have a lower level of uh, flooding as uh, we get into winter, but they're basically in a situation where their country is flattening out, and it was very flat to begin with. Very soon, we'll see effects similar, by the way, in places like Florida. Yeah, I, I. I understand exactly. I've got my eyes closed and I'm picturing it in my mind, and I can see exactly what you're saying. So basically, we've got uh, Venice or Venice in uh, Bangkok now. Correct. So they're just basically going to sink. Now, I'm wondering, and this is a very, very handy segue to another subject. How is this going to affect everything? Financially, with all of this, uh, all of these storms and this ice age and this flooding and everything else going on, how is this going to affect the planet uh, financially? Because we've got uh, the um, little hoop de hoo they got going in Greece today. That's um, we might be off a little bit on the timing, but it appears that we might be right on the cusp of the uh, the big financial meltdown that uh, the webbot's been re talking about. And I think we have a real shot at meeting our 22 hours of very intense release language in uh, on the 8th of November, probably relating to Greece. But the weather affecting the the economy as a whole, we've got to look at what's going on right now with this MF uh, bankruptcy and the derivatives. A component to that is already being uh, is being propagated by the weather. Part of the reason that this company is failing is having to do with a ripple effect from what's going on in Thailand. As all these factories shut down for all these various Japanese and other high-tech manufacturers that are in turn rippling throughout the planet because nobody can get parts, because the, the manufacturing in Bangkok is all flooded out. And even if it's not flooded out, many times now the transportation is. And so it, we're seeing that ripple effect instantly, almost. I mean, it's taken it about 20 days, but um, uh, it's going to be even uh, uh, a greater degree as we go forward here. Now, how long is this going to take for it to get uh, out into the public? Because, you know, we know about it here. We're talking about it. But you don't see that on the news. I don't watch the news anyways, but you would think that people that I know would talk about it if it was on the news. Why isn't anybody talking about this? Why is, is this because like it's a, a big yeah. giant surprise and oops, guess what, folks? <laughs> let me let me ask this. Uh, you ever go outside and see those uh, airplanes spraying the trails in the sky? Well, hell yes, everybody does. I've got videos of it. Why isn't that on the news? That's why nobody talks about it, because it's not on the news. You answered the question. No one's talking about the expansion of the Earth or any of the other really cool things that are going on because it's not in the mainstream. And if you take all of your news from the mainstream, you're, re you're restricted to what the mind control experts want you to understand, and that's it. So what happens when people start figuring this stuff out? They don't listen to the mainstream anymore, and we start seeing cable companies collapse and major news systems collapse and financial systems collapse. And, oh, I guess that's where we're at right now. Um, let's talk about the uh, big Internet shutdown on the, uh, what is it, the ninth? For supposedly yeah. three minutes. <laughs> yeah. I've heard rumors about that, and, folks, I have to say that I have not been able to substantiate the rumors. What I have heard, and I'm sure Cliff has and everybody that's listening, 
is that on the 9th at, I believe it's 1 p.m. Central, and I don't know why they keep using the Central time, but they are saying that not only are they going to be doing the national emergency broadcast on every radio, every cable, every television, and supposedly even on your cell phones, they're supposedly also going to do this on the Internet. In other words, shut down the Internet for three minutes to do their little emergency test, which seems to me like it would affect the financial markets probably a lot if people are doing anything online that requires uh, money. Well, it's going to be a huge hit just to those companies like Amazon and everybody that literally track the amount of sales dollars in revenue per minute streaming in. I used to work for um, uh, some very large consulting service companies for some of the very large software, and we were farmed out to places like that to create software for them that did just that. So a three-minute cost for one particular company that I used that I did some work for, which was absorbed by Macy's a number of years ago, um, that a three-minute cost to that company would be on the order of perhaps um, 15 or 20 million, and it was just a small little company, and that's how much revenue it was taking in on its online basis in an, in the nascent years back when. So this is huge. The cost on those three minutes might be calculated easily in, say, three to four trillion dollars gross business that is not delivered. Now, the expectation is that the business is not lost, it is merely deferred, and that's how the government sold this. But let me also point something out. Cell phones run on the Internet. If you don't have the Internet, cell phones don't work because they're a packet system. And they, uh, their entire control structure is through SCADA and through Internet control. So in order to shut down the cell system or to have access to control it, you basically have to have 100% control of the Internet uh, if you want to assure at a government level that you've reached all of those particular uh, cell uh, towers and control systems. I mean, I used to work in telephony, and it, it gets really complex, and I don't want to get into the nuance of it all, but basically they've got to have one in order to get the other because the two are so closely joined. And should the Internet ever fail in mass, it'll take out the cell phone systems with it. It's only a matter of uh, the number of repeaters and how often the packets get through before they throw into an error mode and they shut down. So I think that the government is doing something that is very, very, very risky because now while the Internet in the ARPA days and DARPA before that was designed to be robust and, sur and a communication system that in its whole goal was to survive a nuclear attack, uh, I am personally, uh, having come through the technology business, a little on the um, – concerned side that when they throw the switch to turn it back on, they may get a few unexpected surprises. It may not turn back on as they expect. That's what I exactly what I'm worried about. I just, I, I mean, folks, you know, those of us that know how the Internet works, it's designed to be redundant so that you can't do this type of thing. And I'm just, I just don't see how... First of they're all, good. they're going to be able to do it, and I don't see how they're going to be able to turn the damn thing back on in a timely manner. There's the Turning it back on in a timely manner is the issue. I used to work at the core level of the telephony companies back when software was first being developed for them, mm -hmm. and they led, they led the way for the rest of the other industries. It wasn't until we could do the billing and rating that we could get enhanced 911 and all these other services that essentially led to the development of cell towers and the com communication system we have now. And that original SS7 software uh, was developed out here in Lacey, and I participated in on, on that project. But, but all of that aside, what they plan on doing is going at it through the trunk lines. Uh, I won't mention the names of the cities because it would make them terrorist targets and all of that kind of stuff, but there's basically only a few spots on in North America where all of the trunk traffic goes through, and these are the the old remnants of the Ma Bell system that, that hang about still in a few strategic spots. And that's my concern is that I know what it takes to actually fire those machines back up again. And the cycle is longer than three minutes. So I'm questioning what the mechanism is going to be that will allow them to, quote, turn it off for that period of time, because if they actually shut down the uh, machinery at these core areas, the cycling will be about 24 hours. Yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking, and that's not entirely good news. That's not a good news for anybody. But no, I w but the question the question comes back to why why in the heck would they do something like that? Because I can't believe these people are that stupid that they wouldn't realize that this is what would what's going to happen. I just uh, can't believe that. I can't accept that. 
I've, I've been in government, and I've worked in government, and I've seen a lot of stupidity come out of government, so I can certainly believe the stupidity part. However, I know that there are IT guys that are right now excreting the small sharp ones about the very idea that they have to participate in this, and they they probably have been screaming for as long as they've heard about this idea. So I'm quite sure that the um, uh, um, more dense minion class that actually institutes the orders and tells the IT guys to go ahead and do it uh, is aware of everybody's concern. And that brings up the issue that you, that you just brought up, which is the why. Why take this risk? What are they going to gain that is so valuable that they're going to risk this huge level of cost? The, the TV and you know the radio interruption is trivial relative to the actual person-to-person -person communication level stuff. Now, there is one thing that in a weird, screwy way, might make it all worthwhile. All of the risk and the potential uh, ramifications of a failure of a smooth restart, okay? Because bear in mind, everybody's going to be all over everybody's case if there's not a smooth restart. And the one thing that came to mind was it would validate their ability to shut the net down, the, the quote, internet kill switch. But get this. <laughs> You know what's also going to happen should this occur? There's going to be an unauthorized person-to-person, um, peer-to-peer -person, uh, -peer network attempt in the absence of the Internet. Yeah. I mean, people all over are already planning. They're, they're generating their own IP structures, and they're going to try some of these tests that you really can't run when the wires are hot with Internet traffic. So we'll see if that's even possible. And that's why I wonder how the, you know, what level of risk. They must know that the uh, 2600 group uh, is going to try this kind of stuff uh, if the wires go down. Yeah, I've, um, I've actually worked on something like that in-house using um, basically a wireless broadcast that if the Internet goes down and we lose the Internet, you know, I have all sorts of web pages cached on my server. All i got to do is throw up my antenna and I'm, Broadcasting at five watts, and everybody within five miles is going to be able to pick up the uh, signal and be able to log on wirelessly. Yeah, there are people though that are going the other route. They're going to try and use the uh, theoretically now defunct wire and shoot signals back and create their own peer-to-peer -peer networking on the uh, on the copper that actually physically is able to connect them all. There, there's a whole lot of screwiness going on with that because of the addressing and the you know the you know, switching and all of that kind of stuff. So. Uh, no point really getting into the detail of that, but it does also present yet another risk to the government in doing this. So I've heard the rumors about the Internet being shut down. If they were going to, if they'd actually said we're going to shut it down on this particular day and came on out and told everybody uh, way ahead of time in an official announcement, um, then I would think there's some more credence to it. But they may indeed think that they can get away with it for three minutes because would you think that your individual connection, if it was only for three minutes, was down or, or would you think the whole Internet was down? Personally, mine go personal internet connection goes down frequently, so I would just assume that, oh, you know, time to go bake a pie. Uh, okay. Pie. Speaking of pie, somebody who probably isn't on the show tonight uh, out there in the east wants to know when you're going to come out east to have some Tayberry pie with them. <laughs> uh, well, I don't travel, but once my boat's all fixed up and I've caught that spaceship, <laughs> then I'll put the boat in the spaceship and zoom on over. We, we are, I've had this thing where... Um, uh, you know, all my life I've uh, had this idea that I was going to be able to get one of these little little uh, zip about triangular floaty jobs that we see so frequently now in the night vision. And so I've tried various baits. So far, no takers. You know, it's probably from visible from space that as you zoom down in on the pie, there's a giant noose around it. <laughs> uh, okay. How how about some um, webbot specific questions? How does sure. that sound? Let, let's do that. Some of these are a little bit uh, technical, but I think um, enough people are interested in this that uh, it should help us out. Um, Gracie Eden asks, what if anything happens to the data once it's released? Does it change in any way by observing it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, certainly. There's absolutely no question of that. We uh, frequently... Uh, run into our own stuff. In fact, as uh, we've processed with our or progressed with our data, uh, more and more of our processing time is filtering out uh, our own data, and I see the ripples from that. They're indeed on a physical level. I've been told, uh, and I have no way of validating this. Okay, but if the circumstances were spooky enough that I give it some small level of credence, and I just <laughs> circumstances.